Look, our work is very, very practical. We want to develop technology to help oncologists, radiologists, and eventually surgeons as well. That's all. So it is a productivity tool. They're not the type of AI that people say will take over the world at all. They're just very practical, concrete tools to help reduce costs and save time. You're listening to the Microsoft Research Podcast, a show that brings you closer to the cutting edge of technology research and the scientists behind it. I'm your host, Gretchen Huizinga. With all the sensational headlines about artificial intelligence, it's reassuring to know that some of the world's most brilliant minds are developing AI systems for entirely practical reasons. One of those minds belongs to Dr. Antonio Criminisi, a principal researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge, England. And one of those reasons is to help medical professionals provide better health care for their patients. Today, Dr. Criminisi talks about Project InnerEye, an innovative machine learning tool that helps radiologists identify and analyze 3D images of cancerous tumors. He also gives us some insight into his work on deep neural decision forests and tells us how gaming algorithms made their way into medical technology, moving from gamer to patient and turning outside-in imaging inside out. That and much more on this episode of the Microsoft Research Podcast. Thanks, Antonio, for joining us from MSR Cambridge in the UK via Skype. It's great to have you with us. No problem. Thank you. So you're a principal researcher on InnerEye AI for cancer, which uses machine learning algorithms to treat cancer. So give us an overview of the work you're doing in computer vision and medical imaging analysis. Sure. My pleasure. So what we do in Project InnerEye is we apply state-of-the-art machine learning technology for the analysis of radiological images. In particular, here we're talking about uh, CT, as in computer tomography, and MR, as in magnetic resonance images. And we're looking specifically at images of patients who have already been diagnosed with uh, some form of cancer, unfortunately. And what the technology does is analyzes those images at a pixel by pixel level to figure out exactly where the tumor is, but also to do what's called a delineation or contouring of organs around the tumor. They are called organs at risk. And the reason why this is important is because, for instance, in radiation therapy, you need to instruct the machine that delivers the radiation, the therapy, to exactly where the target is, i.e. the tumor, but also the organs that need to be spared from nasty radiation. This is normally a process that is done manually with somewhat archaic tools, and we can help precisely in that area to make the delineation, the contouring, and therefore the radiotherapy planning a lot quicker and also more cost-effective. So tell us how gaming technology algorithms are now working in medical technology. How did you go from gamer to patient and inside-out imaging to outside-in imaging? Sure. So our expertise is in machine learning. So for a decade or more, we've been working on experimenting with new, better, more efficient, more accurate machine learning algorithms for doing predictions from images. And those are pretty much any type of images. It could be uh, your holiday snaps, it could be videos, or it could be medical imaging. So when we were working on the technology, we developed some algorithms which turned out to be both accurate and particularly efficient. And at that moment, we thought, hey, if these algorithms work on depth images from the outside of a person, in that case, a player, perhaps they can also work on images where we're looking at the inside of a patient body, in that case. And that's where the project you know, was born, really. So what are the unique challenges that radiologists and clinicians face that your work helps address? Um, you mentioned delineation earlier. You also talked about quantification at one point. Can you talk about how your work has an impact on these two big ideas? Yes, absolutely. So there are many medical experts in modern hospitals who 
are faced with a number of issues and normally they spend an enormous amount of time trying to tackle those issues. In particular, we already mentioned the work of radiation oncologists where they need to delineate with great accuracy the tumor and the organs at risk so that they can deliver safe and effective you know, therapy. In this case, we're talking about radiotherapy. On the other hand, there is radiologists who have got a very different role. In most cases, radiologists, they look at images of patients and they need to assess what they're looking at, the disease, not only the type of disease, but also whether the disease is progressing over time or it is responding to the treatment. And unfortunately nowadays, they do not have very good tools for doing the latter, this you know, assessment and the quantification of the disease. There are no very good quantification tools where you can actually measure, say, the volume of a tumor from a radiological image. And that's where we can help. That's the idea that potentially our technology can be embedded within a radiologist workflow and help translate those radiological images into measuring devices. That's our goal, turning those images into measuring devices where the radiologist can actually write in their radiological report, this is how big the tumor is today, this is how big it was last week, this is how big it was two weeks ago. And so they can then plot the path or progression of the disease with great accuracy and rigor. And that's super important in treating cancer is to see how aggressive tumors are, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. That's just one of the examples. But also it could be useful, for instance, to figure out which drug works best, mm. right? So if I'm trialing different type of drugs, I want to know which one is more effective, uh, faster acting, uh, and so on. Those are just some of many possible examples. You know, it's such a fascinating field that you're working in and so important for so many people. I mean, I don't know anyone who hasn't been touched by cancer as you're looking at an image, you say it's important that people can tell the difference between the bad tissue and the good tissue. How does it do that? Right. So uh, as all machine learning algorithms, the algorithm needs to be optimized or trained. And so what you do is you collect a number of uh, anonymized images which show the same type of cancer, a solid tumor, for example and you have experts delineating the tumor and delineating the different organs at risk around the tumor. And then you feed that to an algorithm who looks at a variety of patterns within the image. The intensity, right, the brightness of the pixels, color if you have color images, but more importantly, the texture around them and also what we call semantic context, i.e. a pixel in the heart is defined as such, not just because of the way it looks, because that wouldn't be sufficient. There is a lot of pixels in the human body, in images of the human body that look alike. Mm. And so it's much more important to look around and see whether that pixel resides in between two very dark regions, which normally represent the lungs, right? So if I know that I can see the lungs, the left lung and the right lung, then I know that in between those, there should be you know, the heart, you know, I expect the heart to be there. Of course, also other structures like the spine and so on. But that gives you a, a little hint of how these techniques work and what they do. They look not just at the pixels and features extracted from the pixels or voxels, but also they look around to see whether there are other patterns that reinforce the idea that that reference voxel should be the heart or the pelvis or the prostate and so on. So your algorithms have to train on good tissue as well as bad tissue so that it knows the difference. That's right. They have to look at the whole image, really, to make sure that they identify the correct region and they classify the correct region as such. That's fascinating because when you're being treated for cancer, I would imagine, you know, please don't wreck the other stuff. I mean, that's what people are looking for is the magic bullet to only kill cancer and not destroy everything else about your body, right? That's right. Absolutely. When we talked about what machines are good at and what humans are good at, how does this particular machine learning technique augment what humans are already doing in radiology and cancer treatment? Yes, that's a very, very good question. So we're very proud of the fact that we are designing the technology around medical experts. We're working with a number of medical experts who are giving us a lot of instructions and guidelines. 
And so, for instance, you know, through this process, we have learned very early on that doctors are extremely good in most cases at the task of diagnosis, which means looking at you know, radiological images and figuring out what is wrong with their patient. So very often, in most cases, they can look at an MR image of a patient's brain and very quickly say, that looks like a glioblastoma or another type of brain tumor, for instance. And that is a very quick process. Again, there are edge cases, not everything is so easy, but for the most part, that's quick. But what we have discovered through working with many clinicians is that measuring tools, that's the problem. That's what they do not have. And so our technology augments their skills or amplifies their skills by providing expert doctors or radiologists in this case with measuring tools, something that they desperately need and they do not have right now. Let's switch over to your concept of decision forests. Most of us have heard of decision trees, but decision forests is fascinating to me, particularly with your novel approach to machine learning, what you call deep neural decision forests or DNDFs. Explain the difference between the forest and the trees and what's unique about DNDFs. Sure. Um, I should also set all of this in the background of you know, the most modern wave of machine learning, which goes under the name of deep learning. Uh, the whole world is talking about deep learning, and in particular, they're talking about convolutional neural networks as a, a very effective and accurate technology. We know and we're you know, very well versed both with convolutional neural networks, but also with decision trees and decision forests. And we have explored advantages and disadvantages of both techniques. And we believe that we are onto a, a new set of techniques, which we call deep forests, where we manage to marry the benefits of both worlds. And in fact, it looks like from a theoretical and algorithmic point of view, those two worlds are really two ends of a continuous spectrum. They're not so different from one another. But to go back to your question, a decision forest is a collection of decision trees in practice, where those decision trees are all slightly different from one another. And the advantage of using a collection of trees translates into better generalization, which is this issue of, OK, I've got a machine learning the algorithm that works very well on the training data. But what guarantees do I have that it will work equally well on previously unseen data, was what goes under the name of testing data? And so the use of ensemble techniques, a decision forest, gives us a little bit more guarantees in that sense. How would you frame the work that you're doing? What specific targets are you aiming at with what you're doing? Um, yeah, good question. Look, our work is very, very practical. Okay, so. We want to develop technology to help oncologists, radiologists, and eventually surgeons as well. That's all. So it is a productivity tool, like Microsoft is particularly good at delivering productivity tools, and they're not the type of AI that people say will take over the world at all. They're just very practical, concrete tools to help reduce costs and save time. Yeah, and that's one of the... You know, there's a lot of scary headlines out there about AI taking over the world or at least getting us all fired. And so as you frame this as a tool to help radiologists in what they're already good at and augment them, I hear that over and over at MSR, this augment versus replace. I find that fascinating with what you're doing with inner eye. Yes, thank you. What other broader potential might this tool have is it really focused just on cancer and radiology and that kind of thing? Or do you see applications in other areas of medical technology as well? We in our team are focusing on image analytics. And so any clinical workflow that can potentially use images uh, of different types would in theory benefit from this technology. And so you could think of pathological images, you could think of malaria, uh, which is hematology images. You could think of 2D X-rays. You could think of you know, higher dimensional images. There are many, many, many options. Obviously, in our team, we want to be concrete and deliver real value. So we're starting small, 
and the radiotherapy area is our target initial domain, really. So as you're working in this area and that's your goal, do you have any kind of corpus of evidence or data that this kind of machine learning technologies are actually working in helping the radiologists and cancer treatment professionals? Yes, we are gathering that evidence as we speak. And so through our many collaborators throughout the world, we're working with many different hospitals in many continents to make sure the technology that we are building together works you know, across different countries, not just you know, in the UK, not just in the US, but you know, as much as possible for everybody. And we are starting to get evidence through our partners that the technology is starting to get really good and we keep working with them to make it even better. Talk about the accessibility of your technology. How does a medical professional mm -hmm. get access to it? How do they use it? So we are working with partners, what goes often under the name of ISVs. And so we are going to deploy our technology through third party software providers. So there are many corporations, many companies who are very, very good at building what's called medical devices, uh, software only medical devices in many cases. And so they are the people, they're the companies who then sell on those devices to healthcare providers. What we do is we work with those software providers and we provide them with our own state-of-the-art AI machine learning technology to make those products better for their end customers. So they incorporate what you've done into their products and then pass Absolutely. that on to them? Okay, that's interesting. Absolutely. So the technology we are developing will be exposed as a set of Azure services. From a medical point of view, you can think of them as medical components, which then get incorporated into a third-party end-to-end products. And that way, we can make our partners better. So as we talk about work in the medical field, there's been discussion about the delicate balance between progress and privacy. And it's particularly acute when you're dealing with sensitive health data. Are there any challenges you face with this technology in light of legislative or policy safeguards? Absolutely. So, you know, we are dealing with uh, very sensitive patient information here. We're talking about radiological images. And so we need to be extremely careful in the way we handle them. And at Microsoft, we are incredibly, you know, aware of all the issues to do with patient privacy, anonymity, and so on. And so we make sure that we comply with all uh, regulations, but, you know, we go beyond there. We are super transparent with what we would do with those patient images. As an example, our algorithms have been designed to need only the pixels, nothing else. In order to train our algorithms and to optimize them, uh, for them to deliver value, all we need is the pixel information. We don't need any patient-related information or any information related to the hospital of origin. And that's a big advantage for us. It, you know, the algorithms have been designed precisely to be as strict and rigorous as possible in terms of preserving the patient's privacy. Are you running into any of the same issues with inner eye, with the GDPR regulations? We are very well aware of the GDPR and for inner eye, we are already compliant with GDPR. We know exactly what the regulation requires and does not require. As a quick example, Again, all the data that is ingested by our training algorithms is completely anonymous. It is impossible to go from the pixels that we have to the identity of the patient, even if there was an attack and someone maliciously wanted to recover the ID of the patient, it wouldn't be possible to do so. Well, that's awesome. You refer to pixels, and I saw a term called voxels. That's right. Tell the difference between those. A, a voxel is a 3D pixel. <laughs> <That's all. laughs> Radiological images often come in a three-dimensional format. Think of a three-dimensional grid in space. And so each element in that grid, rather than being called a pixel, is called a voxel. That's the only difference. So... If I'm a person that's interested in medical science, I might not consider computer science as a way to get to 
my career goal, but this feels like it's a kind of a crossover between the two. Can you explain how maybe somebody interested in working on diseases and helping in that area would find computer science as a good path to that? Yeah, so as you know, computer science is everywhere nowadays, right? There aren't many fields which haven't been touched by computer science, and the same applies to medicine, in particular to radiology. And I see more and more radiologists being extremely savvy about computer technology, being able to write code and program themselves and do a, a little bit or maybe a lot of image analysis themselves. So this is really refreshing to see because obviously the more cross-talk there is between pure computer scientists and, say, pure oncologists, the better for both worlds. So what was your path to uh, medical image analysis research, Antonio? I'm an engineer, and I've always been passionate about images. Therefore, I ended up doing a PhD in computer vision, which is everything to do with algorithms for analysis of any type of images. And then I became passionate about applying those techniques to radiological images, because I clearly saw an immediate benefit there for patients. Then, you know, within Microsoft, I was fortunate enough to be allowed to start looking into that space a little bit more deeply and work with radiologists and, and hospitals across the globe. And I found it extremely fascinating and refreshing and inspirational as well. How did you end up at Microsoft Research in the UK? I did a PhD in Oxford in the UK. Then I was hired into Microsoft straight after that. Uh, so a very simple path. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty straight. You know, one of the things I'm hearing from researchers all across the organization is that a lot of what they're doing is very interdisciplinary, and they're working with people that aren't necessarily all from the same field they came from, and that there's a lot of wonderful cross-pollination. Are you finding that in your work as well? Absolutely. You know, the cross-disciplinarity is, you know, one of the biggest things, you know, the best things you can do for innovation, really. And it's not just me who says that. It is incredibly rewarding also to be able to learn new things from people who don't necessarily speak exactly the same language as you or don't do exactly the same things as you do. It's, you know, it's a great growing experience, learning experience. And at the same time, this sort of cross-disciplinary interaction has got a lot of, um, you know, provides a lot of impetus into innovation, really. As a researcher, part of your life is just discovery and asking questions and then digging in and finding what you find. And sometimes you get one topic as a life work and other times it's like, okay, here's another thing that I'd like to chase after. Do you have any other projects or research interests on the go right now? I have way too many to share, <laughs> but at the moment, I'm, I would like to just be concrete and deliver something of great value on this project. And so that's why for the last couple of years or so, I've been focusing only and entirely on this project. Yeah. You've got a, a bunch in your brain that once you deliver, you can right. move on to. Yeah. No, that's right. It's like the writer who has a hundred stories they want to tell, but. Yeah. One at a time. Yeah. It's interesting to me that your framework is super practical. And that isn't always the case, which is great. You know, you want researchers to be looking at things from a variety of angles. But I imagine that um, radiologists appreciate the singular focus of what you're doing to make their lives better. Yeah, that's right. I think it's very, very important. If you want to deliver something concrete and, and real, you've got to focus. And that's difficult to do, believe it or not, because you have to learn to say no as well as yes. We get flooded with requests all the time from many different doctors, many different hospitals or organizations saying, hey, I've read about inner eye, you're doing great work. Can the technology be applied to problem X and Y? And more often than not, the answer is yes, in theory, it could be applied in those other domains, but uh, I cannot do it. I have to say no, because you know, the resources, <laughs> are, of course, limited and time is limited. Yeah. Sorry, I'd like to say yes, but I have to say no. <laughs> oh, gosh. So 
Any thoughts as we close our Skype session and you go off to happy hour and I get a second cup of coffee here in Seattle? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm happy. Antonio, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us on the podcast. And it was great talking to you. Thank you very much. To learn more about Dr. Antonio Criminisi and how machine learning technologies are helping medical professionals provide better health care, visit microsoft.com slash research.